without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Mr. Tong Sien Hui, who is the Executive Director of Investment at SG Innovate. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming and braving the weather and the elements uh, to be here today. Uh, I think it's going to be an exciting session. I was going to give an intro to SG Innovate, but that has already been done, so I can sort of throw away half my, my prepared uh, opening. Um, you know, as uh, Mikhaya said, I'm the head of investments for SG Innovate. And uh, one of the things that we do is really to, you know, one of the mandates that we have is to grow the local uh, deep tech ecosystem. Uh, this Firestarter chat a series that is organized is definitely in support of this particular objective. Um, this is the second one in the series. I hope you attended the first one. If not, it's online. Uh, but, you know, we are using this as a means, as a platform, really for you know, prominent, successful uh, uh, entrepreneurs, deep tech entrepreneurs to come and share their journey, their experiences with young scientists like yourselves and not so young scientists, uh, so that hopefully you'll be motivated to follow in their footsteps and build the next great company. Uh, we are really privileged today to have Professor Sir David Kleneman with us. I am going to start to read from this because you know, his list of accomplishments and accolades are just so long that I'm definitely going to miss things out and say the wrong thing. Um, as an introduction, uh, he and his partner, I'm sure most of you have read his profile, but I'm just going to reiterate some of those points. Uh, he and his partner founded Solexa about 20 years ago, a company that developed a new way of sequencing genetic data uh, that was cheaper, faster, better. I emphasize the three things to him because it was almost like if it's cheaper, faster, and better, it's a slam dunk. You know, everyone's going to adopt it uh, very quickly um, and more scalable than current methods at the time. Uh, it was therefore no surprise that the company was quickly acquired by Illumina and its method of next generation sequencing is likely to be responsible for as much as 90% of today's DNA and RNA sequencing. Uh, more recently, he started a new venture. I understand that he had a venture even before that, um, but he has a new venture called Ionoscope that sells ion conductance microscopes. His scientific accomplishments are no less sterling. He and his colleague, Professor Bala Subramaniam, won the Millennium Prize in 2020 for their work in next-gen gene sequencing. He won the Royal Medal by the Royal Society in 2018 and was knighted in 2019 for his services to science. Uh, before we get the session rolling, I'd just like to thank the National Research Foundation, without whom this session would not have been possible. i also like to thank my colleagues in the community team for organizing this event. I know it's not easy to do this in the midst of quite a lot of activities. Um, the format for today will be one where I get to ask a few questions because that's my privilege. I get to ask uh, David a few questions first, and then I will open it up uh, for questions uh, from the floor. Um, you know, I'm not going to use Slido because the team is uh, the group is relatively small. Just put up your hand. I think we'll pass you the mic, and then uh, please feel free to ask David uh, the kind of questions that you wish to have, uh, wish uh, wish to know. Um, so to get the ball rolling, I probably will ask David to say a few words with regards to you know what was the technology that he developed, you know, um, how he came about uh, with the concept for Solexa, and uh, Anything else you would like to add to that? So, so the story really starts when m me and Shankar came back to, to Cambridge to start our research groups. And we were both hunting around to, to find something interesting to do. And I'm a physical chemist and Shankar's a chemical biologist. And one of the very exciting things at the time was the ability to detect single molecules using fluorescence. And we decided on a project where we wanted to use fluorescence to watch a very fundamental process, uh, a, an enzyme called DNA polymerase copying DNA. So we got a small grant to start doing the, this project. And um, it was challenging, and the experiments didn't work very well. And, and we spent a lot of time discussing why they didn't work very well. And in the background, the Human Genome Project w was um, nearing its end. And the Human Genome Project was to determine the, the sequence of all three billion bases in the human genome, but this was the average human genome. Um, and, and then there was a challenge to have, have a... 
have a cheaper way of, of doing this, a significantly cheaper way of doing it um, that would re reduce the cost from $3 billion down to $1,000. So, so we were doing this basic research and then we realized if we just repurpose what we were doing, we potentially had a way of sequencing DNA a million fold faster and, and cheaper. And I can and I, I probably should describe um, the idea. So the idea is we put a template primer of DNA, so it's a, a little, it looks like my fingers and the enzymes are going to add the um, complementary to the bases. And what we were going to do is have color-coded nucleotides, just like Sanger sequencing. So an A is a red, um, G is a blue, et cetera. And we're gonna see what, what um, nucleotide the polymerase puts in. And Shanker was going to design these nucleotides so that only one nucleotide was put in. So it would, every, um, so it would just stop after adding one base. And then we could read what base being incorporated using fluorescence. Then we're going to remove the fluor four, and we're going to remove this reversible terminate on the base and add the next base. And we're going to go base by base um, to determine the sequence. And then the other big idea was we're going to do this in a massively parallel fashion. So we're going to have single molecules of DNA spaced about a micron apart on a surface. So we could visualize different strands of DNA. And each strand of DNA w was essentially a sequencing lane. And we're going to sequence billions of, of single strands of DNA effectively all at the same time. So, so for me, I, I sort of had a eureka moment in sort of August 1997. Well, on the back of an envelope, I did a calculation. If, if we had these arrayed molecules, uh, it took us uh, uh, 10 seconds to read uh, a small area. How fast could we sequence um, a human genome? And, and we came up with a number of about five days. And then we were sort of looked at ourselves and said, well, what do we do? Um, we haven't done anything, but this sounds exactly what the whole community is asking for. And so we thought maybe we should write a grant. So we, we started writing a grant and we wrote a grant outline to the Wellcome Trust. And then we spoke to one of my colleagues who, uh, there were a few people in Cambridge who had previously um, um, been entrepreneurs. So Alan Munro, we spoke to Alan and he said, I think you should form a company because you're going to get to the next stage and then you're going to need more money and then you're going to need increasing amounts of money if you really want to develop this into a sequencing technology. Um, so, and he said, I, I know a, a company, a VC called Abingworth, who, who funded me. I'll put you in touch with Abingworth. So we went to Abingworth and I think we were very naive. Um, so we didn't have a business plan, we just presented our idea. That this is our idea, we'll do single molecule stress and it's rounds of sequencing. We're going to be a million fold faster than the current technology. And Abingworth really didn't know what to do with us. Um, normally people come, they've um, de-risked the project, they've got papers and, and patents. Um, but, but to their credit, so, so we went through nine months of due diligence where we went and spoke to experts and they said, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And um, we sort of noted this down thinking that they're definitely not gonna fund us, but when we go to the next VC, we'll have all the answers to all these questions. And then after nine months, it's a fund us, um, but only at a very small level. So they funded two postdocs in our labs for, for a year just to de-risk the project a little bit. And then like Alan said, that they gave us, I think, five, one and a half million, five million, then 50 million. And the company grew from two people to 150 people. And within um, nine years, we literally went from an idea on a piece of paper to having an instrument that that could perform around the level that we expected. And then in 2007, um, Illumina, wanted to buy the company and the company thought it was a good idea to, to, to be bought by Illumina so the company was sold to Illumina and then Illumina continued to develop the technology getting us to, to where we are today where it's, like was said it's the dominant sequencing technology in the world. Um, so, so, the, the, so for me it's a great advert for forming a company because the speed we could go from, from the idea to a real instrument in the hands of people who could use it was just so fast.
Oh, well, David, that, that sounds like a very nice uh, sequenced uh, uh, view of, of the pathway to, to success. But I'm sure there were many pitfalls and, you know, it's a bit, you know, entrepreneurship is a bit like snakes and ladders, right? You go up and you come down, and you get swallowed by a snake. Um, maybe just, just to ask some questions and, you know, I, I know I prepared some questions uh, as normal, but I think I'm going to put that to one side and we'll just have a fairly open chat on this. You know, both of you are very, su are very successful uh, scientists, even at that stage prior to what you're doing. Um, you had a very strong academic career ahead of you. Um, this was taking a big risk to start a company, um, you know, outside of it. Um, you definitely were moving outside your comfort zone. What were you thinking you know, mentally when you were deciding whether to start a company or whether to stay in academia? So, so uh, at the time, uh, that you, we had to basically make a decision to, to either stay in academia and be consultants for the company or give up our academic position and be CSO in the company. There was no middle ground. Now there's a middle ground where the company can buy one or two days of, of your time. And I, and I remember the meeting, we both looked at each other, but this was one of the questions um, um, Abingworth asked us. And we, we basically said, we, no, we haven't got the skill set to, to, be, uh, to drive the company. No, we're academics, we, we come up with the ideas, we're going to stay as academics. And so the, the, Abingworth said, fine, we'll, we'll bring in a CEO and, and CSO to, to drive the company. Um, so certainly in the early days, there was a lot of tension spend. Well, there, two, th th there was two areas of tension. The first area of tension was having the company in our group. And then we had selects of postdocs who were paid a consultancy were sort of superior to the rest of the postdocs. And there was a bit of friction where people wouldn't be so open about bouncing ideas around, but they thought they'd be swallowed up by the company. And so as soon as possible, we got the company out of our labs and, and into their own labs. And that removes some of those tensions. And, and then it was a fairly scientific project, I would say. We had a very clear roadmap of what we had to do. So some of the things, looking back, were very simple. We had to show we could detect a single molecule of DNA with a fluorophore. We then had to, to have DNA and add a nucleotide and show that, that we, it was incorporated and we could detect that. And we did those in the chemistry department. And then we had to make these nucleotides, which, which had all these properties of fluorophore and a reversible blocker. And we had to have a, a larger number of people to do that. And, and we slowly assembled teams of people working on all the aspects of the project. And I, I think that there were two issues. The issues were joining all these different bits together. And that the other issue was, was there, some, there were some problems that were unanticipated and sort of fell between our expertise. And, and so one of those problems is, when we, when we gave talks, we just had four bases with different colours and a polymerase. And we said the right one would be put in. And that's not right because the polymerase um, uh, works at micromolar concentrations. So the real picture should have been millions of all these bases and only one was going to be incorporated. And the problem we found is that we could have um, bases that weren't incorporated into the DNA that stuck to the surface and then we couldn't distinguish a real base that had been incorporated versus one that just stuck to the surface. And so we had to do a lot of work on the surface to make it incredibly non-sticky. And so the, the, that took a, a lot of work um, to try and fix. And then the, the, uh, and, and related to that, um, further down the road, um, we had the nucleotides, we, we mutated the polymerase, we had a, a, um, a fairly decent surface, um, but, but it was still, and we could do, I, I think, five or six cycles of sequencing, but it was just getting harder and harder. And at that point, um, there was a company called Mantea um, in Switzerland, and, and they were also, and there were lots of companies trying to develop DNA sequencing, but they, they'd folded and they developed a way of amplifying one molecule of DNA to 100 on a surface, and we could come in and we could buy that patent. 
and once we had had that that ability to to take one molecule and make it a hundred there was no issues with surface sticking we could simplify the technology and that was the last piece of the jigsaw that really accelerated the technology so, so i think there were two problems one was the sort of unforeseen problems that you bump into and the other issue that that was a big concern is we could implement everything perfectly and someone might implement it better and faster and get to market sooner and uh, the second ceo that that we had was incredibly keen that we got the instrument which wasn't really optimized it was quite slow at scanning we got that to market so we were the i think the first commercial instrument and that turned out to, to have a massive impact on the trajectory the other thing uh, we were discussing is, is we didn't just get money from the VC, we, we got quality money. So the VC um, put in very senior people who had been very experienced in working big pharma or working in startups, who really ensured that we patented very strongly and stopped us making silly mistakes, that they ensured that we brought in high quality CEOs, CSOs, people who had ability, uh, used to managing large numbers of people, and, and that really made a difference. And the other key element is they, we formed an SAB very early on. And the SAB was all the people who ran the Sanger Center, which was just down the road, which the Wellcome Trust had set up to, and they ended up sequencing about a third of the human genome. So we had the end users come, regularly coming to our meetings, and we just were continuing making sure that what we actually ended up with producing was something that they actually wanted. And I think that was very important. So the, the ecosystem, the, stakeholder, the key stakeholders were very much involved in how, what direction you took. I'm, I'm just curious to know, because uh, you know, this is one of the challenges which a lot of deep tech startups face, which is you, know, you get a CEO which is very more business-minded. He has some inkling of the technology, but not probably uh, as much as uh, you and your partner. How do you reconcile some of the differences like for instance you are facing that challenge of you know the technical hurdles uh, at that stage i'm sure the ceo at that time was saying hey, get to market as quickly as possible and you know at some stage how how do you reckon I, I don't think there were many tensions because um you know when we did the, the put the first nucleotide in we had a discussion is that a product is there anything we can do and the sab said no you you just have to do that 20 more times that's the product so, so there's never any opportunities. So it's, it's a very science-driven project. We really had to, to go from the start to the finish as well as we could, as soon as we could, and then that was the product. There was no way of coming off the road. It was just a, a linear road. I've been involved in other startups where there are lots of forks in the road and you can go right or left, and, and then there are lots of problems. But here it was just... Um, the CEO's only job was to ensure we had enough money to, to, to go to the next phase and get prepared, um, think about who was going to buy the product, how it could be used. But we really had to get to the end of the road, and there were no branch points, it turned out. It was a very straight road. That's a very ideal. <laughs> um, along, the, on, along the way, you obviously had to hire a lot of people. I mean, you said that the team grew to about 100 were there any challenges in recruiting the right people? I mean, you were a, st a startup with perhaps less visibility com as compared to some of the bigger uh, players in the market. So we recruited a lot of people from our labs. You know, a lot of our postdocs were very keen to join the company. There weren't that many startups around Cambridge, so it sort of it was a nucleation point. Lots of people were very keen to, to join. And um, I think the, th the thing that, that we did very well is, is we recruited high quality people at every stage. Um, so the recruitment wasn't such an issue. It was really created an opportunity for lots of talented people to all focus around one project. I don't know what would happen if we did the same thing now, but there's a lot more startups around Cambridge, it may be much harder. But at the time, getting quality people was not a problem. There weren't that many startups around Cambridge, particularly in this space. And on the IP side of things, the, the university, um, how did you negotiate with the university on the IP rights, the transfer, the royalties? The so license? there wasn't that much to, to negotiate. So, so we had some initial concept patents that, that, that 
we filed when we formed the company, but we essentially hadn't done anything. So there wasn't very much to negotiate about. Um, so there, there wasn't any, any real friction. And, and secondly of all, um, the university was one person ran the whole tech transfer office for Cambridge. And, and that person, Richard Jennings, really just wanted to set the, the us going and, and was very facilitating. And also we'd go and talk to him and he would make the decision immediately. There was no someone he had to talk to. So it was very streamlined. If we did it now, um, Cambridge has a tech transfer office of about 100 people and it's much more challenging and there are lots more checks and balances in place. And certainly Shanker formed another company that did epigenetics and that was nearly, um, didn't happen because it was so, there's so much bureaucracy in place. But at the time, I think the advantage of, of doing it, being one of the first people is that um, the less checks and balances and, that, and there are far few people trying to do this. So, so we, we essentially had lots of, it just made much easier for us, I think. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the, so there are pros and cons. I think uh, Cambridge in those days perhaps was a lot smaller, the tech transfer office was a lot smaller, um, but perhaps fewer startups, as you said, so less competition for scarce resources, especially talent. Uh, today is a little bit different. Um, what was the, you know, you, you exited to Illumina and we had that conversation upstairs, so I, I sort of know the answer to this, but I thought the, it would benefit the rest to sort of hear how the process, the whole exit process came about uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of how you sold the company to, to Illumina. So, so the, the exit process, uh, uh, well, there, there were two points one could exit because the, the way the company, the, the company did a reverse buyout of a, of a company called Lynx as a quick way of actually um, listing on the NASDAQ. That was the first exit. And then the, the, the merged company still called Selexa um, in 2007 um, was approached by Illumina. So Illumina um, had this uh, microarray technology based on, on beads and wanted to acquire a sequencing technology. Selexa at the time had a working instrument but didn't really have the engineering capacity to really continue to drive down the, make the improvements. and the, um, didn't have the nucleotide DNA sequencing technology and, and didn't have the marketing. So it was a win-win. It was a win for, for Selexa, a way of fast-tracking um, to a bigger market. And it was a win for Illumina because they could acquire the technology. I, I think the only loser, um, and I don't think there was any way around this, was, was in an ideal world, um, it would have been acquired by a UK company and the whole thing would have stayed UK. Um, but I think that was not possible. So, so you know, in a sense, um, the Select Illumina is a great example of developing the technology, but, but I think the UK government would want of it to be entirely based in the UK. And so that was sort of the only slight negative, but I think that was just not possible at the time. Yeah, I think most governments are like that, <laughs> without prejudice. Um, so, what, what, where is the future of gene sequencing? And now I'm asking you to take a look forward. Uh, what, where's the, where's, where does the future lie in gene sequencing? So, so I think the cost has gone down recently from $1,000 to $200. There's another company that claims to have it at $100. But it's really plateauing out. It, it's very hard to see it going down much more. Uh, and meanwhile, we've sequenced uh, about a million human genomes. We're starting to understand the, the genetic contribution to lots of diseases. So as a research tool, it's still being used widely to discover more details, but we know a lot of the important points. So the main thing is application to human health. So um, there are lots of examples. I know you're doing it here in Singapore, but in the UK, the, the examples are in cancer, where you, you sequence the, the cancer genome, and then you can have, hopefully have drugs that um, target the pathways that gone wrong and have a precision treatment for the patient. Um, the, the other big area is in um, rare diseases, particularly newborn infants, 
and you sequence a mother, father, and the baby, see the differences, work out what pathways have gone wrong. And in many instances, there's a treatment and you, you can treat the, the baby. And, and that's now been rolled out on, on the NHS. And it's also used in prenatal screening for non-invasive um, um, prenatal um, working out the, the health of the baby. And I think it's just going to become used more and more, it's just part of a more routine. You go to your, your doctor, and, and, and you'll be sequenced to give you the right medicine. And then there'll be a tipping point where, which I, I think will come in the next maybe 10, 10, 15 years, where um, the government decides, well, you, your treatment's going to be determined by your sequence. Why don't we just sequence everyone when they're born? And you carry your sequence around on your, on your phone or, or whatever. And when you go to the doctor, you hand them your sequence, and they, they work out the best treatment for you. Fascinating yet frightening. Um, okay, so I'm going to start to open up the floor for questions. Um, I just have one last question for Dave before I do so. Um, your origin story is very interesting. Everyone talks about that uh, pub or that place where you had beer with uh, your partner before uh, you made that decision. Tell us what was going on in your minds. Was it the, the beer talking? Was, it, was there some real uh, uh, key decision making during that, that uh, session? I mean, I think, I think the important thing is, is not the beer. I think that the important thing is, is talking to each other. Um, so, so there's sort of a, a, a mode of operandi of science, you know, historically, that sort of gentleman scientists, you do everything yourself and, and you, you don't work with other people. And, and, and I think the important thing we did was work together. was to work together and talk to each other and educate each other about um, molecular biology. I, I educated Shank about fluorescence and, and just spend time bouncing ideas. I mean, it's easier over a pub and maybe after a few drinks, we, we got a little bit more speculative. But, but I think it, it's, it's more, the point is it's more social activity and a more collaborative activity. And uh, the, the whole thing about, the, about Selexa is, is Individually, neither of us could have made it successful, but collectively and working together and complementing each other, we could. And the, the pub is, is, is a way of interacting and talking to each other. Sorry, I just had one. Sorry, one, one last question. So I'm sure working with a partner... I'm just going to turn this off. Okay. I'm just this out there. Now, working with a partner is always challenging. Um, obviously, lots of good times, but... I, I don't think we really had, looking back on it, any big conflicts because I was dealing with my side of the technology, he was dealing with his. And like I said, it was a very linear path. So there was never any, it wasn't a situation where Shankar said, we're going right. And I said, no, we're going left. Um, we, we never had that situation. It was more, you know, we'll be discussing issues with, with his part of the project, then issues with my part of the project, and, and we just had to, to work together. So we, we never had that, that real tension. You know, we, we both agreed to, to, you know, like I said, it's a straight road. We both agreed to get on at the start, and we had to work together to get to the end, and there was no, no way of getting off or no, no, no branch points. So we really didn't have any conflicts. Oh, that's ideal. <laughs> okay, um, let me open up the floor for questions now. Does anyone have any questions? Just raise your hand. No one? Everyone? There's uh, one here. Sir. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tomaso first. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks for the, for the insights. So my name is Tommaso and uh, I work in the field of quantum computing. And I've always been fascinated, or at least I, I love to, to speculate about the applications of quantum computing specifically for the field of genomics and molecular biology. So the question I have is, is the following. With these new technologies, we can create a lot of data. We can sequence uh, DNA much, much faster. Uh, you know, millions of individuals and so forth. So we have a huge amount of data. 
And we are starting to understand more and more about the mechanisms of disease and health and all of that. So the, I'm really curious to hear from you. What do you think are the biggest computational bottlenecks when it really comes to using the data in a meaningful way and in a way not only what I would love to see is a future where we can use the data and get to the, to the very end of the role of DNA in human health. And I still feel that today we are only scratching the surface of, of our understanding. Well, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure I know the answer. I, I know that our CEO, um, when we merged with Illumina, John West, um, got himself, his wife, and his two children sequenced. And then he, just like you're alluding to, he realized that there wasn't a, there weren't um, mechanisms in place to interpret that data. So he founded another company to have better ways of actually going from the DNA sequence to the types of things you're alluding to. So, so I, I don't know what the bo bottlenecks are. I, I, my impression is it, it's just number of sequences and, and really following people the health trajectory. So in the UK, they've, they're, they're taking samples from, from people, um, I can't remember, say every five years, they're following their health and they're sequencing them. And we really, I, I think, need to, to go through a, a generation where we've done that to really understand what's going on. I think it's very hard to do it when we've got the sequence of, of people we don't know. We, we haven't got good data on what happened to them when they were a child, where they had infections, um, bangs on the head, whatever, and how that contributed to, to whatever disease they end up getting. And I think we, so we need a full history. So we almost need a generation that have been sequenced. We know their full medical history. And then I, I think it becomes possible. But at the moment with a partial medical history, I think it's a very difficult task. And I, I don't know enough about computing, quantum computing or otherwise, but I think without that, the information about what, what happened from year naught to 50 and you've got someone from 50 to 60 you, 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 and people are doing different things, um, um, you, you can work, work out what's genetic and what's environmental. I think there was a question here as well. Hello, uh, my name is David Cleansing. Uh, one of the first things I did in a lab back in the 80s was DNA sequencing back when it was still radioactivity and acrylamide gels. So, and I've basically been doing it my whole life. So I, I probably should thank you. You've given me about half my scientific career uh, doing it in NGS. Um, my question is about before all this happened, uh, even earlier stages, were you doing DNA sequencing? And were you guys like living and breathing DNA sequencing, or did no, you come, come at it from the outside? So we came at it entirely from, this is a new toy for physical chemists called single molecule fluorescence. What's it good for? Um, we thought it was good for the, the vision was, let's watch biology in action. And Shanker worked on DNA polymerase. And so the, the experiment was, can we watch DNA polymerase putting nucleotides in? Um, we didn't think, we, uh, and that was the experiment we were trying to do. Um, and then, like I, I said, we, we realized w exactly what we were trying to do with a tweak was a, a way of sequencing DNA very fast. So, so entirely, you know, it, it was entirely fortuitous. And, and some of it was that in the news that... Um, um, Bill Clinton in year 2000 announced the, the, the consensus human genome. And before that, um, there was all, a lot of excitement. It was overhyped, in, in my opinion. But there was a lot of excitement about the first human genome and what it would mean. And there was a lot of, of press about uh, the need for, for faster sequencing. So, I mean, it, you know, it's really true that, you know, we, we went to the pub to discuss why our experiments weren't working. And then we're talking sort of... Um, discussing uh, the Human Genome Project, and then we realized, you know, there was a very good match. It was entirely fortuitous. 
and and I mean I think that the things that that I think we with benefit of hindsight we did well is we recognized there was an opportunity for us you know we, we could have just said well we're not going to do DNA sequencing and we'll just do our experiments so we recognized the opportunity and explored the best way of of, of realizing that opportunity but you know but to be honest we really didn't know if it was going to work or not but we we thought well it sounds like it might be really important we at least should try and see how far we g can get and we don't want to look back and say i wish i'd done that at that time point so you know we we pressed all the buttons we could we formed the company and, and off we went and you know if i'm honest it took off much went much more smoothly than we ever imagined uh, and you know and a lot of it is the the quality of the people we had at every stage um the quality of, of the the vcs the management team everyone all, all 150 people who worked at selexa and and then once it got into the scientific community everyone invented other clever ways of using it single cell sequencing and Illumina took the technology and improved it by several orders of magnitude. And, you know, when we, we had our SAB meetings, you know, we could imagine people using it, but we couldn't imagine the numbers, 90% of the, of the world's sequence data on, on the platform. You know, we, we couldn't imagine the costs going down as low as they're getting. So it just exceeded our, our op most optimistic expectations. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the insightful discussion. Uh, my name is Jasmine. I'm with SG Innovate from the investment team. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding just now you mentioned that uh, during your entrepreneurial uh, journey, uh, you were at the point that you uh, need to decide uh, whether to continue improving the, the, pro uh, the product or launch to stay ahead in the competition, right? So we, uh, during my work, I uh, face, I also face this kind of um, uh, founders or innovators. Uh, they want to, uh, always want to optimize the, the product, but don't know when is the best time to make this uh, commercial decision to launch uh, the good enough to, uh, to get the market share. Right, so I would want to uh, see your advice that what were the um, considerations you had when you uh, made that decision and what would the appropriate sources to get the information to form the thesis to make the decision? So, so I, I think the way it worked for us is, is we, we came up with the initial idea and we were heavily involved in, in the company, particularly at the early stages where we, we showed that, that some of the key steps and we got less involved as, the, as it moved towards a commercial product. And so we weren't really consulted in any detail about when they made a commercial product. That, that was the, relied on the CEO who was a very experienced person. Um, so, so there, there never really was a, a tension like you described. You know, essentially, the way it sort of worked, it, this was our, our concept, and, and we got it to a stage and then handed it over to someone else to, to make it robust and make it work reliably. And it was their decision when to go to market. And, and John wanted to get it to market as soon as possible because there's this big advantage of being first to market and, and, be, and people pull using it first. So that, that's what he did. And, you know, I think the technology is successful for two reasons. One, the way we sequence is, is very close to how nature replicates the, the DNA. So it's very accurate. Um, but the other reason is it so successful is a commercial one that we were first to market. So it's those combinations, if one's honest, that's it, why it's 90% of, the, of, the, of the, the world's DNA sequencing is on, on that platform. Um, but there were tensions, but the, the tensions were different. Um, the tensions were, we were young academics and we've come up with, with this idea and it was now working and we wanted to publish it. 
And we would go to the, the, the meetings and say, can we publish it? Can we publish a methods paper? They said, no, no, we have to patent it. Um, and so both of us had a 10 year decision five years into the company and we didn't have our, our best idea wasn't published. And we both got tenure, but it was that that was a tension. And eventually um, the paper got published in Nature. And then there was still a concern that, that there were 150 people on that paper and that they didn't, it was very hard to, to work out who had done what and that we wouldn't get recognized for coming up with the original idea. Um, but, but over time, that, that, that's turned out not to be a concern. And, and you know, we've got these prizes that, that recognize us, or at least our contribution to coming up with the original idea, though we're always very careful to say how much of a team effort it is. So, so the, these problems turn out with the fullness of time not to be problems, but certainly at the time we were jumping up and down saying, please can we publish? I can imagine. Uh, I think this gentleman here had a question. Uh, my name is Sham, and I actually I'm a student at National University of Singapore. I'm doing my MBA, and I was ex-consultant, worked for McKinsey, and then Tata. I was actually uh, consulting for one of the startups in Singapore, and uh, they had something, a technology which was very much related with the genome sequencing. My point is like the moment when I started working with them, and we started working with the authorities, the first question that came in was like, like the hurdles for such kind of startups, like the one which you had, like the technicalities with the government, how, like, is the approval that easy? The regulatory authorities are very stringent on such startups. Did you had any issues, like, you know, when you were scaling up or like when you were working regarding the approvals or so? So, so we, we were just selling the instruments to, to people to do DNA sequencing. So there was no regulatory hurdles. We were just selling them to academics okay. or other companies who wanted to do sequencing. So we entirely avoided those types of issues. Okay, so you never had any kind of such issues? No, no. Basically, it, all the people who were going to buy it were the big sequencing centers. So the Sanger Sequencing Center replaced all, all their um, sequencing instruments with, with the Lumina sequencing instruments, and same with all the other big sequencing centers. And, and so th th there weren't any regulatory issues. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's actually a very good point to, to note because uh, that's how Illumina started as well. I mean, they started just selling to the R&D community and you know, they, they built a huge company around that. And I think that's the fastest path because you bypass all the regulatory hurdles and, and it's a very quick path to market. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ke Yi. Um, we are actually working with Illumina right now to okay. develop their next generation of uh, bit chip array, low cost. Yeah. So my question to you is... Uh, when you come out with the invention, the technology, do you have to design the, the, the hardware, like the bit chip, to capture the bits so that uh, the bits can uh, reflect the fluorescence? Uh, I mean, ours was very conceptual, I, I would say. It was, um, this is the, the you know, it's, it's the, sort of the PowerPoint slide. It was color-coded nucleotides, the DNA primer attached to the surface. Uh, the, the engineering, um, um, we, we had some crude design, but, but the engine, engineering w w was done by a team of engineers. So, so you know, the, the whole thing I, I found about a company was you need to, to really know what your core competence is and what you're, what you're not good at. And, and so, you know, I, I'm not an engineer. I can't design the cells, so I wouldn't pretend to do that. I would just... The big advantage of a company is we, we can get in it someone who's a skilled engineer to do what we want them to do. And it's all about identifying what you're missing and bringing in the, a good person to do it. So our, our contribution was very intellectual, I would say. It was all coming up with an a, a, a entirely orthogonal way of, of doing the sequencing. And then the the important technical details were, were dealt with by people who are experts in those particular areas. And the advantage of us of having a company is we had the money and the ability to bring in what we needed to get the project to work. And as an academic, you know, we get stuck because, you know, we want to build something, we, we can't build it because we, we don't have the skill set or 
Um, we don't have an, the expertise in the software. We have to, you know, that we can't retrain the student to be a software engineer. But in the company, we just buy in some software engineers and, and tell them what we want to do. And, and that's the reason, I mean, the, the, the two reasons why it went so fast, I think. One is, is we had access to increasing amounts of money as we needed it. And the other thing it went so fast is, is we could bring in any expertise we needed, get consultancy with the experts to sort out any problems we had. And so for me, if, if you have anything that's potentially commercial and you, you want to get it into the hands of lots of people, um, the company is a really good way of doing that because if we stayed in the university, we'll still be trying to develop DNA sequencing now. I think this. Okay, Tomaso, you can ask me for all. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, Sabrina. Uh, used to work in genomics in a previous life, and one regret I have is not being born a few years later because I would have been able to do my PhD work in half the time <laughs> using your technology. Um, my question is about um, the path to mass adoption. How do we get from that one million uh, genomes to one billion genomes and where it becomes really the norm? Um, in a healthcare setting. I think, unfortunately, today most, uh, most practitioners don't really know what to do with a, a genome. Um, payers don't necessarily uh, make it by default uh, reimbursable, and um, you have the B2C sequencing companies, but they're not really allowed to provide much medical insight. It's mostly for recreational um, purposes. I would love to have your thoughts on that. So, so I think it, it depends on your healthcare system. So. Certainly in the UK, it's a government-funded healthcare system. And, and certainly in the UK, like I was alluding to, I think there'll be a tipping point where you're using sequence data so much to, to make medical decisions, but you're doing that with people who, who've got quite severe disease and costing you an awful lot of money. And you could have caught it much earlier or prevented it from happening, and it would just become an economic argument that you should sequence everyone um, early on. But, but that's in our healthcare system. Uh, if you're in the US, I'm not sure how that would work. You can imagine people who can afford to do it being sequenced and people who can't afford to do it not being sequenced and ending up with a really unequal healthcare system. But they already have a very unequal healthcare system. But certainly, I think in Europe, I imagine we'll reach this tipping point. I think the tipping point does need enough people to be sequenced that it's very clear the advantage that it holds. Because before a large number of people have been sequenced, it was unclear how much is genetic and how much diseases, everyone has a different disease, different genes that go wrong, and how much people have common genes that go wrong. And now we have that information. So, so I, I, think it, I think it's going to be an economic argument because certainly in the UK we get people with type 2 diabetes and then it's a tremendous cost. And, and I think someone could sit, do the simple calculation and work out that, that it's um, much more cost effective. And so I think in Europe, I think, I think we're not too far away from that. But, but I, I think in the US it, it's, it's going to be problematic. So, so that, that, those are my thoughts, but I, I'd be interested to see how it plays out. Because, uh, so, so for certainly, an, yes. Well, Finland have, I think, sequenced a third of their population. And, 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 and you know, that, that they're starting to be able to say to people, um, this is your... Um, we know your genetic sequence, and this is your... your age along here and your probability of getting disease along here, you're on this trajectory, so you're, so you're on the top trajectory and you're very likely to get this disease. I suggest you eat less and exercise more. <laughs> and, you know, and, and apparently a lot of people are eating less and exercising more. And, and I think that that's the, the future, I think. But maybe on this trajectory and you can eat as much as you like and sit in front of the television and you're not going to get type 2 diabetes. <laughs> I certainly would like that. Well, David, I think uh, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, I just have one last question, but not to David, but actually to all of you. 
I know that there are some investors here. I recognize some from corporates, some academics. Is there anyone here that is in the process of rationalizing or thinking about whether they want to start their own company? I know there are some startup founders here. You guys have already thrown your, your hat in the ring. Anyone in the process? Okay, good. We will be tracking your progress uh, very closely. <laughs> Hey, there are KPIs for this event as well, man. I mean, we've got to you know, be realistic about it. But yeah, um, David, thank you so much. I think this has been very insightful, very interesting. Uh, we wish we had more time. In fact, we do have some more time. That's why the, the wine bottles are sort of scattered around there. I hope you can join us for a short while. I'm sure they would like to informally speak with you. Um, and uh, yes, call this session to an end. I think let's give David a big hand. Thanks.